Your job is to go get more work. Your job is to lead the business forward. And your job is to make sure that your systems and processes are, are healthy as your business grows. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And in this episode, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Robert Ewan, associate of the AIA, the CEO and co-founder of Monograph. Robert was trained in architecture and recognized the need for better business tools and developed Monograph to address the challenges facing architecture and engineering professionals. As a result, he's become a leading voice in the industry, promoting the importance of A&E business performance and helping firms improve their workflows and profitability. His mission is to always be in service to the design professionals responsible for our built environment letting them focus on what they love and do best. Monograph is a software company revolutionizing the future of architecture and engineering firm performance. Firms use Monograph to make quick and confident decisions about budgeting and resources to drive their practices forward. In this episode, we will be discussing Monograph's recent benchmarking report, what benchmarks are included and how to improve them, and where and why practices have to earn the right to engage in certain business activities in their business. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Robert Yuen. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Robert, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Once again, how are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing really, really well. It's a Friday. I'm it's, excited. It's Friday. We've got a weekend coming up, Easter weekend, and um, very excited to be talking to you as always. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan of Monograph and I'm constantly recommending it to our clients. It's my prob probably the go-to one that I suggest to clients to look at when they're getting themselves sorted out with financial management and earn value management and just being able to mm. get proper financial eyes on what's happening on the performance of the business and i was really excited with the recent business benchmarks reports that you guys have produced first of all like just congratulations on everything that you're doing at, ben uh, at monograph because the responsiveness of your team the feedback i get from our clients who are using it it's all just amazing i think it's a beautiful looking bit of software uh, and it's been really well thought out specifically for architects and one of the things some of the feedback I've gotten from our clients who use it is you know they often say well you know something's missing in the software and they'll jump on the phone with one of your advisors helpers um, and within the space of a few weeks that functionality actually has emerged and is now up and running which I think is amazing. And I know last time we spoke, you said yourself that you've even, you know, you, you jump on the call, you jump on a call with people, with the users. Um, and I think that says a lot about your attentiveness and depth of understanding of the marketplace that you're, that you're dealing with. So let's, let's start with the, the benchmark report and what instigated doing this. Well, well, first, I just want to say really, really thank you. I think it's a huge testament to the team here. Um, and for those who don't know, I, I strongly believe a, a strong business culture is really essential. Um, and it's absolutely part of our DNA to always put our customers first. And we'll see that play out from, you know, all the way at the top at me um, to everyone else in the organization. And it means a lot to me for you to hear that and for the for our customers to to validate that and tell each other that's a, that's a huge testament. I'm extraordinarily proud of it. I'm extraordinarily proud of my team. 
Amazing. One of the big reasons that we decided to do the report was we crossed a really major milestone last year. Uh, we crossed a thousand customers. Um, we're an extraordinarily data driven business here. Uh, and we drive a data driven culture. And we understand that we can produce a benchmark report without a large enough sample size. Uh, the thousand customer mark that we crossed last year was the, the moment that I was like, okay, we now have enough of a cohort and enough of a sample size to start really understanding um, what the profiles of our customers look like from the bottom quartile to the top quartile. And what does good look like? And what does great look like? Uh, not bias but based on performance and based on mm -hmm. data. Great. Now, there's a few interesting differences that I think is worth pulling out between the benchmark that you, the benchmarking report that you guys have produced and say something like the AIA or the ROBA produces mm -hmm. or even something that we've produced ourselves here at Business of Architecture where we you know we've kind of surveyed a number of of clients and 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 listeners to the podcast before and i know how much work goes into compiling these sorts of reports and then it's a it's a no small undertaking so what would you say was the big difference between a lot of these other surveys that have been done and the ones that monograph has produced i i think when you do a historical survey and you ask someone for their opinion of how their business is going there's always going to be, let's say, opportunities for error because like, let's all be honest, we all want our business to be really, really great. Mm -hmm. um, so we might inflate the numbers, even though we might not be, be extraordinarily honest, not on purpose, mm -hmm. but when you base historically a measure of the entire industry on just a question to that firm owner, uh, you would have to then question that there's a margin of error and legitimacy to that response. Yeah. Our first principle approach is like, well, we, we, we are building an incredible company and incredible product that serves this very, this very problem. We should surface legitimate answers to what is those net revenue per employee and what is the net performance of a business unbiased based on anonymized data from our customer base. It's a fundamentally different approach. Which one yeah. I'm really, really excited about because it ensures that the accuracy is much more spot on and removes a lot of the margin of error that's historically done with a survey. Mm -hmm. I, I think this, this is actually quite profound, right? Is, is that <laughs> you've got everybody reporting ultimately using the same kind of platform and yeah. with, with a very similar way of considering and looking at their finances which suddenly makes changes the game completely. And we know that, you know, you know, one of our experiences when we were getting data back from people was we had to put, we had to cat start categorizing data or we had to start creating a, a spreadsheet, if you like, or a, or a data capture mm -hmm. survey that had predefined answers in it to try and deal with the wild inaccuracies or where people were finding themselves. So the, the fact that you're able to kind of have people produce reports using software that you know inside out, I think is a totally, you know, different way of looking at it and is really on the pulse and, and very, very interesting. So it's a huge game changer. I think as our sample size grows, where I'm really, really excited, at least when we look at the whole industry, mm -hmm. we'll be able to drill down into regions. We'll be able to drill down into typologies of work. Yeah. We'll, be, we'll be able to categorize and subcategorize based on size of firm. Mm -hmm. uh, all we're doing now is waiting for those sample sizes to catch up to a meaningful quantity mm -hmm. where, where the benchmarking report is actually useful. Yeah. But that, that part, I'm really, really excited. And then for each customer, over time, we'll be able to essentially say your improvement with Monograph like you started here, you're now here, you're on your trajectory to X. These are amazing tools that like architects have never had before. Mm -hmm. um, quantify based on performance and not based on uh, sentiment. Brilliant. So can you tell us a little bit about how the data was actually collected? I'm assuming it wasn't something that was, you know, people, they produce a report themselves using the software and then submit it, or was it something that you're able to pull back end, if you like? So we were able to pull back end 
because mm-hmm. we're a software business, all that data sits there. We run through mm-hmm. an extraordinarily thoughtful exercise of anonymizing all the data. Right. Um, so like there, there was really no extra work from our customer base. Right. Okay. So you can actually just go in there, look at it, anonymize the yep. data, make sure it's all safe uh, yep. and, and, and looked after. And, and then actually... We can put in our own rules as well. So like we, we obviously serve a really wide part of the market. We go from mm-hmm. anywhere from solo practitioners all the way to firm sizes that have about 100 employees. But we really narrowed in to firm sizes somewhere between single digits, 5 to about 15, 20 and really hone in where that's the largest sample size that we can collect. We also remove any any companies and customers that were not in the United States to make sure that the data that we're looking at was extraordinarily US centric mm-hmm. because that was our largest sample size. Got you, got you. Um, do you find that there's a, a kind of very uh, a more populous demographic that you serve in terms of architecture practices? Like what's five the to what's, twenty-five? Say it again. Five to Firm twenty-five. Size is between five to five to twenty-five. Right. Okay. So that kind of mid mid-size architecture practice to small. Yeah. Great. Now, one of the the first kind of rallying cries of the report is this call for radical transparency, mm. and and again, this is something I'm very keen and passionate about, like the idea of. You know, there, there was the old guard of architectural um, governance of a practice, which was normally everything was kept behind lock and key. And, you know, never would you talk about money with the team members. Team members don't know what, what the budgets are, what the fees are, how much money is being spent here and there. And still that kind of culture persists. And I think it's very difficult for certainly younger project managers to be able to do their job effectively if they don't have, at the very least, access to time budgets for a project which have been generated from you know a thoughtful exercise of actually you know comparing data putting together a proposal and you know taking out profit margin first and and actually kind of creating a project budget so what from your perspective what is what is radical transparency what does it mean it i'll try to describe it really simply you can't work on something you can't see Mm -hmm. It's really that simple, um, and I think it's a, we're in we're in a transformative time where if we want to be a very different industry and we want to be a much more high performing industry, we have to put some of the old ways behind, and we have to acknowledge that a person can't work on something that they cannot see. So you, it's extraordinarily hard for a young project manager to be accountable for a project budget when they don't know what the project budget is. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult. It's like, okay, I have to stay on time and on budget. I know what the timeline is so I can work towards that. Mm-hmm. But I can't stay on budget if you don't tell me the budget. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. Like it's, it's extraordinarily simple logic here. Um, and then through our platform and through our other content, we try to make sure we can constantly encourage that the right way to manage your business is to continue to be more and more open and transparent. Mm-hmm. If you're behind schedule, it's a rallying call to the whole firm. That no one wants to lose. No one wants to lose on a project. Get support. If you're a principal and your owner, lean on your team. Mm-hmm. Your team is your largest asset, and they're there to help you. And no one wants you to fail. But no one can work on a problem when you can't see the problem. Do you? actively empower your customer client base to have the whole team engaging with the platform with monograph rather than it just being something that sits in the in the realm of the of an office manager or maybe the partners are only get to see it is it something that you're actively like you know project managers everybody needs to be using the software daily to be able to see what's what's happening absolutely that, that, I believe also that's the downfall of historical older software right. where you would buy software and one person, an office manager or a principal, might manage the software for everyone else. Mm-hmm. It, it's actually counterintuitive. Like you want participation from the entire organization and you want the entire organization to understand their efforts and their inputs 
uh, impacts the output of the work. The simplest way we do it every day in Monograph is we help our customers track time. Each individual tracks time of an organization. And as they enter time, everything moves. So it really becomes like a gas gauge for, for a project. So as a designer, you know that every hour has an impact because every time you enter an hour, dials and our money get and our project progress moves. It's extraordinarily empowering. Yeah. It also changes behaviors because then you go from a mindset of tracking time once a week to tracking time every day. Love it. And this is what, where it gets really interesting is it's kind of people are able to self-regulate, hold themselves accountable. There's a gamification around it. You know, enlightened CEOs can start uh, attributing, you know, rewards and, you know, gamifying it internally, um, you know, with, with performance metrics. And I, I think it's incredibly powerful and very glad to hear that, you know, this is something that everyone in the team starts to use. It's not, you know, it's not just for the office accountant or manager. I think that's very, very enlightened. It's super important. Imagine a young designer today mm -hmm. who might, you know, this will make me extremely proud, who might go through half a decade to a decade of using Monograph in various capacities throughout their career. They would have learned financial literacy while being on Monograph. Mm -hmm. And they will be now way more equipped 10 years down the road to lead a firm. Yep. Uh, that will make, yep, I will be extraordinarily fulfilled uh, as an entrepreneur, as the founder of Monograph, to have played a small part in, in the growth of like a lot of young designers. Fantastic. So let's have a look at some of the metrics that you were calculating for people and and first of all, we've got things like net revenue per full-time employee, net cost per full-time employee, mm. utilization rates. Probably that's probably one that every firm. Should, I mean, they, I would hope they were keeping an eye on that pre pre monograph. Um, the idea of time to payment, your realization rates. Why did you pick these numbers or these ratios for some of them? What what did you feel was the the kind of usefulness or the utility of these metrics? These, these are one of the most important metrics for any business to utilize. And they're, they're industry agnostic. So really what that means is like, these, these are not, let's say, vocabularies that are uniquely for an architectural industry. These are metrics that are extraordinarily important for any service-based business. To understand a really high-performing service business, these are standard financial literacy that everyone should learn. We've focused here because this is also where I have a, have a strong opinion where the industry can do a lot better in learning in mm -hmm. terms of what financial literacy is and what are the financial vocabularies that they need to understand to manage their business. These are all essentially top line KPIs that business owners should learn and should watch mm -hmm. at, a, at a various cadence to understand the performance of their team. Great. Now, so if we look at something like the net revenue per full-time employee, could you tell us a little bit about what that means and what is it, what is it telling? What is it measuring? It is essentially measuring the total amount of fees from your services minus any discounts or refunds or, or any type of allowance and then divided by your entire team count. Mm-hmm. This is really, really important because what it gives you is essentially a North Star of saying of all the work that I bill and provide, this is my earning potential per employee. Now, if we do simple math, that number needs to be greater than the average salary of your, of your employee. <laughs> like it's, so th this is why these, these metrics are really, really important because yeah. it, make, it actually makes the finance part of the equation of running a business a lot simpler, mm -hmm. way more simpler. It's like, look, your net revenue is your total revenue. And if you know what your average employee salary cost is, if that number is greater, that's the first good sign. The second good sign will be, well, how much greater? Because um, a lot of that will then cover your overhead because this, mm -hmm. this is all net, net revenue. And this will also cover profit margins. But like at basic concept, it has to be larger than your average salary. If it's not, we 
we should sit down and we should we should work on that. <laughs> We've got a problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I noticed here you were pulling out a kind of a, around about the two hundred thousand dollar per full time um, employee mm -hmm. as being you know a benchmark for a high performing business, which is echoes exactly what um, here at Business of Architecture. I mean, we have a we have a an initiative called the Two Hundred Club, which mm -hmm. is our clients that come onto our training programs. You know, we encourage everybody to set a milestone of being able to hit two hundred thousand dollars per full time equivalent employee as we know that when we see businesses achieve that, then a lot of other stuff becomes easier to, um, to actually kind of execute on. And there's a bit more comfort in the business and it's the hallmark of, you know, there's some, there's things the business is starting to do very well. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear your take on the, some of the benchmarks that we've seen in the past from say the AIA, the AIA or the RBA. Um, my criticism of them has often been, well, number one, what you're saying is that they're, they're self reported. So there's an accuracy question about them. Then the next is they're often reflecting an underperforming industry in the first place. So if I use the UK as an example, and the ROBA will take uh, a survey of all of its members and it will demonstrate that the average take home salary of a sole practitioner is about 25,000 pounds. Okay. Which is as small as it sounds, right? Even, even by Californian standards in London, <laughs> that, that's just, that's a, not a lot of money. And it's a very difficult amount of money to live off uh, in, in the central, in the capital city. So that for me is not a good, that is not, a, that's not a benchmark. That's not a, it's not, it might be the average, of the industry, but it's nothing aspirational. Correct. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I don't think anyone would aspire to earn twenty five thousand uh, pounds a year. And, and I think this is also like one of the biggest historical problems with older surveys is mm -hmm. one, like if you're if you're surveying across a really large sector that's underperforming, you might looking at the average might not be the best way to like understand what's going yes. on yes right? yes you, you might want to look at the medium or the mean mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to really understand what the quartile performances start to look like because mm -hmm. um, what you might get and this is why sample sizes are important is you might get a really large pool of accounts that are making twenty five thousand pounds a year yeah. um, that are struggling but they're driving the average towards that direction and then you gain a few outliers now that are actually running an extraordinarily successful business. They're mm -hmm. making, let's say, 200 pounds. I don't know. I'm making mm -hmm. a guess here. Yeah. Um, but because there's just more logos at the 25, you drive the average down. Yeah. What you really want to start doing is looking at mediums and you want to start looking at quartiles because mm -hmm. um, it's not a really great way to understand a benchmark of the industry. Got it. Got it. And so is, is, is that how what you were doing here with the how yeah. you were analyzing the statistics yes yes like Great. The, and this is also why narrowing in your criteria and having rules like look we're not can't look at the entire industry it, mm -hmm. the same thing could apply if you look at the entire industry with no filters and you get a couple of cancelers a couple of slams a couple mm -hmm. like eight k's now you're going to assume that the net revenue per employee might be closer to 300 400 um, because some of these larger firms, they're built, their building rates are so high and the types of projects they work on are so large that that ratio starts to be very, very different. So I think like really understanding like, well, what's the segment that this, that the survey and the benchmark is looking at? Do everyone in that segment look the same? And mm -hmm. is it an apple to apple comparison? Uh, these are really, really important questions for every architect to look at when mm -hmm. they're reading these other reports. Because there's a lot of bias when they're not. Did you find that the numbers change significantly in different parts of the, in different states? We don't have enough strong sample size to really right. have a leading indicator to make that judgment call yet. But and this is, this is why I'm really, really excited. The first benchmark was we have a thousand plus customer right. pool. We're actually approaching 1300 now. Mm -hmm. So as that grows, we're going to be able to drill down to certain markets and really understand it. 
But I don't think it's a really helpful exercise to do a benchmarking exercise unless you get a strong enough sample size. Sure. Um, because if it's, let's say we're in New York and let's say you only have two firms, well, that's What's the point. Yeah. That's not, it's not going to make for a great benchmark. Like we want a, a certain saturation of a certain market uh, to really understand and then run a benchmarking against it. Do you have an idea of um, how your how your clients are distributed across the states? We do. We, we we have a geography map, so like we know we know where we're doing extraordinarily well. We know where there's there's trends that we're doing extraordinarily well, and where mm -hmm. areas where we're not doing well. The general takeaway is like we do really really well in major cities. Yeah. So like in anywhere there's major cities and there's a, there's a lot of reasons there. There's there's a higher concentration of architects. Mm -hmm. um, the the word of mouth between one architect and another architect is a lot higher. So we do really really well in in big cities. Great, great. Um, let, let's have a look at the utilization rate because this is one that I I would hope that every architecture firm at least has some sort of grasp on or that they're measuring it. Um, could you help us understand what it what is utilization rate right? and why is it important for for a firm? Utilization rate is really really important, right? Because it really starts to understand the effectiveness of each employee, and you you have to assume that an employee is never going to be a hundred percent utilized. Um, it's just physically not possible. You do need to take lunch, you do need to take breaks, and you mm -hmm. do also. It's a creative industry. You do need to spend time mentally and physically in, in areas where like you have to explore options that are not billable. Um, this is important. This is important for every architect to understand. What we want to do is measure what is the right healthy utilization rate that a business should have. And in high performance firms, what does that healthy ratio looks like? On average, if you're doing anywhere above 80%, you're a really, really good firm. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a number for an office, like a blended average of the whole office. Correct. You can also assume that like your utilization rate for a principal is like extraordinarily lower um, yes. because they're not spending their time on billable projects. So th this is an average across the whole firm. Do you have benchmarks um, that you would suggest for individual roles inside of a practice? So a benchmark for, say, an architect one and then the benchmark for a for a CEO? We, we have all that data, all that data internally in LMIs. We mm -hmm. haven't, that will probably be our second version of, uh, of the report where we start to really drill down and segment based on role mm -hmm. um, and, give, and give everyone in the industry a little bit more clarity in what that utilization rate will look like. Because it is, it is not the same. Yeah. But similar yeah. to the rest of the report, it really depends on sample size. And we want to make sure we have enough sample size so we can be extraordinarily accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that becomes really interesting because now we're starting to see actually, you know, you, you start having utilization rates, one for the whole firm, that's already brilliant. Now starting to get more granular of kind of benchmarks or ranges for utilization rates for individual um, job roles. That becomes really useful, it becomes really useful for the individuals in the team. It becomes really useful for the CEO designing their business. I think it's also, and this again, this is, might be a bit obvious, but it's really useful for the CEO to realize for most architecture practices, I'm going to assert here, they're probably doing way too much work in terms of billable work. And they're not, and they're not involved. They're like in the weeds, they're drawing or they're doing stuff where actually their higher value activities is probably going to be non-billable work like marketing, prospecting, you know, designing systems, et cetera. Correct. Because if, if they're not doing it, then no one else is. Yes. Right? It's one of the most important jobs of a, of a principal, of a, of a founding partner, is mm -hmm. your, your job is to go get more work. Your job is to lead uh, the business forward. And your job is to make sure that your systems and processes are, are healthy as your business grows. It's the responsibility of a leader. What's really cool about our, the utilization rate that we present is we, we've made our criteria extraordinarily tight. Mm -hmm. So we're not, essentially, we're already not bringing in a principle into the equation, theoretically. So some of the criteria that we, we use for the utilization rate was it had to be a firm size between three employees to 30 employees. Mm -hmm. 
anything outside of those ranges, we did not count. After that, you have to have at least 2,000 billable hours over the last 12 months. Right. And then on top of that, your utilization rate within Monograph has to be somewhere between 50% and capped out at 100%. Mm -hmm. So we, we've actually made the parameters really, really small mm -hmm. and really, really tight uh, to make sure we present the best look, the best view out there without going into roles. But like when you, once you really account for all these parameters, we're already essentially filtering out a principal. We're already filtering out a lot of the partners uh, in the business and really focusing on employees that spend a lot of their time working on projects because they're they're past the two thousand billable hours per year and mm -hmm. they're above the fifty percent utilization rate. And then we ran the report. Great, great. Um. Let's look at realization rate. What is that? Realization rate is super, super important. It's a, it's a, it's a much better indicator of financial health than utilization rate. Mm -hmm. A high realization rate suggests that a firm is extraordinarily successful in converting those billable hours into revenue. So the biggest difference here is utilization rate is just where your time is spent. Yeah, realization rate takes it a, one step further and like, well, we want to make sure you're capturing those hours as you bill for your work. So looking at these two really important high level metrics gives any business owner really clear line of sight of like, okay, I, I can understand that most of my team is working on billable work. That's utilization rate. Awesome. And then you realization rate, well, how, how effective is that utilization rate now converting to revenue? Right. Um, and that's a much harder question and much, it's a process problem too, because typically now billings involved, typically either done by the principal or some, or an office manager or internal bookkeeper. And you want to make sure you're capturing enough of those hours in your revenue. Right. Right. So it's really a, a kind of, a, a, it's actually a very, a very good indicator of the productivity and yeah. it's, it's efficiency and the effectiveness of the of the operations so we're we're one at one number like a utilization rate you can assume that you'll never hit 100 mm -hmm. on the realization rate you want to come so close as possible because yeah. theoretically for every hour that you do utilize you do want to capture on a revenue basis mm -hmm. so you do have aspirations to drive towards 100 percent where a utilization rate, you kind of want an aspirational goal of like driving towards around 80 to 85%. Yeah. So this is really giving eyes onto the damage that like unmanaged scope creep can, <laughs> can create. <laughs> right. And this is a really common scenario in a lot of architectural firms where like, okay, I have a high utilization rate. Everyone's working on billable work. Awesome. But if your, <laughs> if your realization rate is under, let's say 80% or 90%, yeah. Oh my God, that means you're actually doing a lot of work, even though it's mm -hmm. billable time, you're not billing it mm -hmm. for a number of various reasons. Either one, the, you, you've spent more time than you should have, and you, you're having a difficult time of articulating that to the client, or it's scope creep and it's completely different types of work, even though the work itself is categorized as billable work. This is where I think a lot of friends of mine and customers of ours, like when you don't understand both of them together, you don't really have a clear picture of the business because mm -hmm. there's a lot of examples where there's a high utilization rate and very low realization rate. And that's still really, really bad because none of that time is actually converting to revenue and none mm -hmm. of that revenue is coming back to the business. Got it. Got it. Um, Let's talk a little bit about going back to these, these two numbers, utilization and realization rate. One of the gray areas that I'll often hear from people is, well, we've got people who are learning. So we've got younger team members. And this is an interesting kind of thing about the architectural industry and in professions in general, right? So there's, there's an expectation on the business side from in the profession that people learn the craft whilst working. And from a business perspective, this becomes complex because we'll start to see architects who, you know, they'll put people onto projects 
who are learning and they'll have people who go to meetings, for example, they're not really doing anything, but they're learning. So then the question becomes, well, where's the line of this being billable? Where is this now being something that we need to take as an overhead? How do you help clients kind of make that distinction? And is it something that, well, in many cases, it's got to be looked at situation to situation by the project management, project manager and a set of criteria needs to be put into place. And, or do you make it easier and just say, you know, X percent of, of all hours spent by this, by this demographic of team member is going to be considered as training? It's the, the it's, kind of accounting for the informal training that happens or the informal learning that happens on projects. I, I think this is an extraordinarily interesting topic and really hard to answer uh, mm. because I, I think it is firm to firm and it's governed by the culture of the firm that, that implements, let's say, their own guidelines and how they, how they invest and how much they invest mm -hmm. in the upcoming gener the next generation of architects. Yeah. What's, what's really important is regardless of how you invest and how much you invest, as a business owner, you have a, you have a fiduciary responsibility to the success of that business. So let's, let's ensure that first. Yeah. <laughs> like like yeah. there is, there is no business for you to train people if there is no business. So yeah. let's, let's just make sure that the business is healthy enough so that you can then make your own governed decisions on like how to invest and how much to invest relative to the health of the business. It, it's one of those scenarios. If you're not a healthy business and you're not making enough of a margin to cover the investment and you're overly investing in the younger staff, well, that logically doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I, I think how you do it, each owner should make their own decisions, but I do believe each owner should earn the right to do it. And the mm -hmm. right is not like you have to earn it. I love Which that. means get the business to a healthy spot I love that. and then you can determine how much you want to invest. And I think you should invest a lot, but I think that's on a case by case scenario. Mm -hmm. And I think you earn it along the way. It's not, it's not a given right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm very glad that you said that. I, I, I see it a lot in businesses and, you know, we have to ask the question, are you a school or are you a business? And, you know, many times we'll see, particularly with the smaller practices, um, and particularly when there's a practice that is not, that doesn't have their financial third eye open, if you like, and they're yeah. kind of walking around blind, they'll make a reactive decision to hire cheaper, apparently cheaper seeming members of staff, which normally means more inexperienced because that's what they can afford, if you like. And then, of course, give it a year down the line. And actually, they're less productive now because they've spent so much time training somebody to do the work and rather than hiring someone more experienced that might have been a bit more of a um an outlay financially to, to start with but now they've got a team that can actually do the work that they're doing and it will free them up the time to be able to go off and market and sell and and bring in bigger work and it's absolutely what you're saying is you've got to earn that right to be able to really invest into into people we've got to You've got to put the oxygen mark, mask on yourself first. Before Just like start. on the plane, yes. Ex exactly, before it's yeah. kind of, we're, we're trying to be these, you know, altruistic. Um... I, I want to be very clear, right? Like, I think there's, there's no wrong or right time mm -hmm. to, to essentially, like, bring on a junior staff and someone that you want to invest in. You can do it when you're a really small firm. You can do it when you're a really big firm. Mm -hmm. In either scenario, you just want to make sure that you've earned the right to do that. Mm -hmm. And you understand the trade-offs. And there's trade-offs to every decision, right? That you could hire someone junior and they're going to cost the business less, but you're going to have to spend more of your time. Mm -hmm. Or you can hire someone senior. Yes, they will cost more, but you, will, you won't have to spend as much of your time. And this is why it's hard for me to answer because like every business during different life cycles of that business is going to look very different. And you're going to want to make slightly different trade-offs. In either scenario, it comes down to, well, what's the health of the business? Let's understand that first, and then let's have a debate and a conversation of like what is the appropriate trade-off, and understand the consequences of each decision. Mm -hmm. Time to payment. So again, this is a, another interesting one, and something that often upsets and shocks me when I see 
A, the amount of outstanding AR that might be older than 30 days that practices are carrying around. I'm often shocked and upset when people tell me or they argue with me and say and claim, well, it's like a savings account. And I'm like, yeah, it's a savings account that you haven't got access to because it's in somebody else's bank account and they're, they're, they're earning it. But this is, you know, on a serious note, this is, you know, I've seen practices with carrying around, you know, 90% of all of their AR is older than 90 days. Um, and I've seen things like that. I've seen a practice um, here in, 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 the, in the New York, they had about $2 million worth of outstanding payments and it was chronic. And, th and their average revenue was about 1.25 million. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Like, oh, it's completely upside down. <laughs> that, was, that was the worst that we've, that we've encountered. But it's a really, really serious thing. And this can, this can tank a business. Yeah. Um, so, so what's your perspective here on time to payment and, and the benchmarks that you're uh, looking at in this report? So the, the report from our customer base, based on our criteria of segmentation, reports somewhere around 34 days, which I'm really, really proud of Monograph mm -hmm. customers. Because um, th this is important. Like, it's, let's look at, I'll repeat, utilization rates, how effective each employee is, your realization rates, how much you're able to actually bill. Time to payment now becomes important because, well, it's one question to bill it. It's another, it's another question to actually collect it. Um, so you want to keep that window as tight as possible. Um, and you don't want, you know, your a AR lasting really more than like, ideally not more than 35, 45 days. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, everyone understands it's a service-based business model. What that means is like your time is charged. While that's going on, when you have a really long time of time to payment, everyone here can probably relate. Some of the struggles are, well, I still have to pay rent. I still have to pay. I still have to pay everyone's 401k. I still have to pay everyone's salary. Like there's just general operating costs that as a business, it's not going to wait. Like that, that, comes, that comes either every two weeks or once a month. My general advice to a lot of firm owners is you want to try to align your time to payment window mm -hmm. to the time of expense window. And that generally is on a cadence of a monthly. Um, and you want to make sure you cover. If you don't cover, then it's, it's simple math. If you don't bring in enough, you have to borrow. You have to float it. Um, you, have to take, you have to pull money from other areas before that money comes. Time to payment is really, really important. And it's mm -hmm. not okay to wait a long period of time. Yeah. We're also in a period of time in the, you know, globally and, and here in the U.S. market where we're still seeing hyperinflation quite drastically. Mm -hmm. So let's say that $2 million, that example that you told me, that $2 million balance. Well, that $2 million balance now is not worth the same. Yes. It's just not. Not, it's not when you're waiting speaking, that long. It, it, inflation is it? Yeah. Yeah. Like, that it, you, just, you can't think of the same $2 million as the same $2 million because like, everything went up. Cost of yeah. groceries went up, cost of utilities went up, cost of labor went up. Like your same $2 million is actually not the same. And I'm pr I can almost guarantee there is no interest clause on, <laughs> on that contract. So you are, you're not covered like from, from that perspective. Like your $2 million mm -hmm. is actually substantially worth less. So your time to payment becomes really, really important because the longer you wait, the less of that money is worth. And the longer you wait, the more you're going to struggle to cover your operating costs. Mm -hmm. You want to get to a cadence where your time to payment is really close to a month, month and a half. Mm -hmm. Great. I love this. I remember we spoke last time about this idea of cash flow cadence and just the, the rhythm yeah. of, of money and just how fundamental it is to well, just your sanity as a business owner, really. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to run a business when like, Yes, you have a lot of invoices out, but like if you haven't collected it, but I'm still paying mm -hmm. for all the operating costs. Eventually, uh, that will become extremely hard burden, and the money you do collect is not worth the same. Mm -hmm. So, how do you suggest that you know companies? You know, let's say they get set up with Monograph, they now have got these optics 
available to them and they can start to see and often you know this is a bit like looking in the mirror sometimes when when a company sets themselves up and they start seeing what their performance is and sometimes they can be despondent and upset and disempowered what's the what's the the next step in terms of like improvement to some of these metrics like how how do businesses start to plan to to you know get themselves up to two hundred thousand dollars per full-time employee or to get themselves up to 80 percent utilization what what sorts of things should they be looking at or strategies should they be looking at well like like we said earlier like if you didn't even have a mirror Mm -hmm. you couldn't work on the problem this is also this is why like when you go to a lot of gyms there's a lot of mirrors so like you can like you're obviously there to work on personal health and you want to look at yourself as you improve Mm -hmm. Um, so if you don't have the mirror that's the first problem this is monograph's first step at addressing the issue it's like okay track really simple like let's just get a really good idea of where your current business is at once we know that and we can acknowledge where you are and where you want to go then we can work on it then strategies and tactics become a lot simpler to talk about it's like okay your time to payment hypothetical let's say it was like at 90 days great we want to get that down to like 30 30 to 45 days we want to cut it in half so let's look at why is it taking so long mm-hmm. and that could that question could have varying degrees of answers depending on the customer it could just be their their end clientels are not structured appropriately, the contracts aren't structured appropriately, or the billing processes are not structured appropriately. Either one of those we can definitely improve on, and each one of those are probably going to be unique from firm to firm. Mm-hmm. What I see very often, though, is a lot of contracts are structured around billables, around phase completion. That's the easiest thing to start to address is to move away from billing against phase completion. So this is kind of milestone billing, which is very vulnerable to all these outside factors that you've got no control over. And that also almost immediately pegged you to a cadence of some version of three to six months to maybe a mm. year. It really depends on how long that phase is. Like you, you now have lost control over cadence. So Brilliant. the first thing to remove is like, if, you are, if your contracts are structured that way, let's rethink how to set expectations on how you're going to bill so you can drive down your time to payment to around 30 to 45 days. But mm-hmm. if you're pegging to a phase completion, like that's your first obstacle. We got to get away from that. Got it. Great. Um, I think we're coming up to, to time here and this has been absolutely brilliant. And again, I'm so excited about these reports and look forward to seeing the, the next iteration of it and how you guys are just going deeper and deeper. Um, with it and you know we're here at business fighters we can continue to sing the praises of of monograph um but i wanted to ask you another question slightly different from what we've been talking about which is i've interviewed over the last you know 10 years or so quite a number actually of architects who have endeavored to create some form of project management software for Mm -hmm. other architects you're the only one who have I've spoken to twice or more than once. I've spoken to a few. This is our, this is our third or fourth interview. I think it's our third time we've Thank spoken, you. right? What, what, why? Why do you think you guys have survived um, versus many others who have, who have attempted the same thing, but they've, they've fallen short? Well, that, that's, a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> and, I, I, and I don't know who you've spoken to, right? So like, there's, there's nothing for me to respond to other than, and, and without that information, I can only lean on where Monograph is extraordinarily strong. Mm-hmm. So like I said in the very beginning of the podcast, like we are, we are 100% customer-centric. We have to be. Yep. That, that can never waver. We're solving a really, really important problem that's highly complex. We're also solving a problem where the industry has varying degrees of how they bill, how they track, how they manage time. It has mm-hmm. never been, let's say, prescriptive enough across the entire industry. So these are things that we're working against that we have to continue to acknowledge mm-hmm. and, and work through. And I think we do that extraordinarily well. And I think every time we, we let's say, I want the industry to be more transparent. For that to happen, Monograph has to be transparent. 
And we mm -hmm. have to also drive a culture of transparency so that the team here, whatever we do, it, 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 it essentially aspires and transpires outward. So how I run the business also matches the aspirations of what I want the industry to become. So here at Monograph, we have what we call an all hands meeting every Thursday, the entire company comes online and you know what I do? I talk about our numbers. I talk about where our revenue is. I talk about where our goals are. I talk about what we're doing along the way to modify and change so we can achieve those goals. And we're mm -hmm. very open across all of our finances and we're data driven. And I want that to continue to say like the product we build encompasses a lot of the culture that exhibits here at Monograph outward because we want the industry to also behave that way. Love it. Love it. Wonderful response. Robert, thank you very, very much for again, for your time and your expertise and just shining a light on the industry. And um, I look forward to us speaking again. And perhaps next time we, we speak, it will be in person. And I'll I can't pop wait. Over, pop over to San Francisco. I can't wait. Now, now I'm so curious on who else have you spoken to? <laughs> yeah, you have me thinking now. I'll let you know. I'll let you okay. know. Awesome. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello listeners, we hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.